I want to stick with my plan. I don't want to be before you long. Let's go to Luke 19 and start reading at verse number 28. I am after two verses, but we're going to read 17 of them. Amen. Uh, a, a, a little bit more than we normally do. So for those of you who can't, please, you can have a seat. Don't mind. But if you're able to stand, just stand in reverence to God's word. We're reading a few more scriptures than normal. I'm going to tell you in advance what I'm after. I'm after verses 41 and 42. And uh, I'm after the crying Christ this morning. He is weeping. And we want to talk about why. Amen. Amen. I'll even give you my title in advance, Trusting God's Solutions. Trusting God's Solutions. Trusting God's Solutions. It will tie into our Good Friday night uh, service and so, or worship experience or time together. We'll just go right into the word, I believe, on Good Friday night. Join us online. We'll be talking about deliverance in disguise. Deliverance in disguise, the covert mission, the covert operation of the crucifixion in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I believe it's around verses 7 and 8 where it talks, where it talks about if the rulers of this world had known, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. And so we want to deal with that, how God was working something undercover and in disguise, how he has a myriad of ways of exercising and executing his sovereignty. One of the ways is he can manipulate evil and use it for a purpose that you don't even think that it's accomplishing. Oh, I can't wait till Friday night. Somebody say deliverance in disguise. But we want to take this and this will set the table and usher us into that trusting God's solutions. Trusting God's solutions. Luke 19 starting at verse number 28, and we're going to read down to verse 45. Many of us know the story, but I'm believing there's somebody who's hearing it for the first time. There's some new believers in the faith we've just baptized. They're reading through scripture for the first time, so I don't want to rob them of that experience. I want them to know the stories. Amen? Amen. Luke 19, verse number 28. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. Somebody say Jerusalem. As he, approached, as he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find a cult tied there. Somebody say tied there. God knows exactly where you are. You say, how do you know that? If he knows where a cult was in between two cities, in between two towns, he says a cult tied there. If he knows where a cult is, how many of you know God knows exactly where you are? Job testified, I can't find God right now in the middle of this trouble, but I know one thing, he knows the way that I take. So I may not know where he is right now, but he knows where I am. Somebody say, he knows where I am. So go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Look at the meticulous knowledge. He knows every detail of the cult's life. I'm just, uh, this is not going to be, not what we're dealing with, but since we're reading it, I just want to talk about it. He knows every detail. Nobody has ever written it. He knows what job you have, what job you don't have, how many years you work, whether you're retired or not. If you've been with a man or a woman, if you've been married, he knows everything about you. The Bible says he's so in tune with you, the very hairs on your head are numbered. Oh, somebody talk to me here this morning. He knows at 30, you started with about 30,000. He knows at 69, you're down to about, all right. He knows the very hairs on your head and he has assigned a number to them. He knows when you get a haircut, what number hair that you lost. 
Oh, y'all don't know when to get excited here, church. I'm just trying to alert you to the fact that God knows you. So when you get down on your knees and pray or when you're going through some circumstance during the week and you're wondering, does anybody see? Does anybody know? Does anybody care? God knows me. He knows where I am, where I'm tied, the numbers of hair on my head, which no one has ever written. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say the Lord needs it. That's a good reason from stealing from somebody. It's just the Lord needs it. Amen. How would you like it? I just went in your pocketbook, ladies, your wallet, fellas. And you say, what you doing, pastor? And I'm going to say, the Lord needs it. The Lord needs it. Those who were sent, uh, were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the coat, its owners asked, why are you untying the coat? They replied, what? The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the coat, and put Jesus on the donkey, y'all. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down to Mount Olives, there's a change that takes place now here. On his descent, I want you to watch this now. There are some things in this text that don't match. When he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, somebody say goes down. He's beginning, he's beginning his descent down the mountain. And as he's descending down the mountain, you, he looks over and he starts to see the city of Jerusalem and all of its beauty and all of its glory, all right? The whole crowd of disciples began joyfully praising God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Verse 38, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Verse 39, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. Verse 40, it should be in red in your Bible. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, I've so fixed it that creation will praise me. Oh, y'all didn't read that right this morning. If everybody in here closed their mouths and decided, made a willful decision that they will not praise the Lord, God says, I have rocks, I have trees, I have animals, I have creation, I fixed it where if you don't do it, I'll make creation start crying out on your behalf. But since I gave you something that I didn't give to the stones, I gave you a mouth, the ability to communicate. The least you could do is open up your mouth. So as he approached, as he approached Jerusalem, verse 41, and saw the city, here's where we're going, look, they're rejoicing, but he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. His weeping leaves them into prophecy. Verse 44, they will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. I just wanted to read that to keep these two verses in context. Verses 43 and 44 deals with some things that take place in Jerusalem in the decades ahead. But we also read that and believe that prophecy has far-reaching implications that are yet to come. For those who will reject Messiah, who will reject Jesus Christ 
as Lord and Savior. You know, if you go over to Israel and Jerusalem like right now, you would be surprised to know that there are people who have no idea who Jesus is. Don't assume just because they live in the land that they know and understand everything that's going on. Numerous times they see believers coming over, getting washed in the Jordan and visiting all these places as tourists. And they have Gen Zers and Gen Alphas just like we do. And they're looking like, why is this so special to you all? There is a segment of the Jewish population who have rejected Jesus as the Messiah. So pay attention to that. Even in the last days, the Bible alerts us to the signs that people have rejected Jesus, that they will return to many of the Old Testament uh, rituals and traditions, trying to reestablish the temple and restart the sacrifices that we read about in the Old Testament. Why? Because they have not trusted Jesus as the final sacrifice. And so you will see that. And so he deals with that. And all of this is a cause for his weeping. We'll get into it. But read 41 and 42 one more time. Thank you for standing with me. You're going to sit down in two seconds, but I'm going to keep standing so I don't feel too bad for you. Verse 41, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day, look at this, he's crying, if you had only known what would bring you peace, that's what I'm after, trusting God's solutions. Father, we thank you for this word, for this time together. We declare that your word is blessed, is exalt, exalted in our hearing, in our reading, and in our doing. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen, amen. You can take your rest in God's presence, trusting God's solutions, trusting God's solutions. Before I get ahead of myself, make sure you leave with a bulletin today. I, I wrote one uh, this week for Passion Week, and it does not have today's sermon uh, notes and, and lesson in it. This, today's lesson, again, is not uh, so note heavy. I have just one or two significant points that I want to give to you around this narrative, but I did want to give you uh, for Passion Week the events and the, and the happenings of the week that take place. Holy Week, or also known as Passion Week, it marks a pivotal period in the Christian calendar preceding Easter Sunday. And so it gets its name from the passion that Jesus demonstrated during this week as he willingly, willingly embarked on the path to the cross. And so each day of the week, uh, there's something significant that happens. There's uh, some minor debates around the happenings in this week, um, but the events comprising Jesus' last week uh, are broadly accepted by most theologians and Bible scholars. So most of them, there's some minor debate, but most of them will kind of agree around the happenings of this week that I have written for you. And so I write to you what happens on the day, the meaning of it, uh, its importance and the Bible verses that go along with it, that go along with it. And so uh, each gospel finds something different and, and a unique perspective. And we'll talk about that in a minute, in a minute to, to, to emphasize something in the life of Jesus. And so one may have something that the other doesn't have. But one thing all four of the gospels have are the events of Passion Week. So none of the gospel writers miss that. And so each day of the week, make it a part of your devotional, perhaps. On today's uh, Palm Sunday, read the verses there. On Monday of Holy Week, Jesus goes through and cleanses the temple so he can teach. And so you see the verses there. Uh, and so you want to read that on Monday. On Tuesday, uh, the teaching and the parables and the Olivet Discourse in Matthew. And you'll see that in Mark and Luke as well. Wednesday what we call Spy Wednesday. That's where most theologians and Bible scholars generally believe that Judas agrees to betray Jesus, and so uh, he's working in a covert underground operation looking for the right time to get Jesus. There's a timing component that must take place because the crowds are following him 
after Jesus feeds the 5,000, now the ministry explodes. What was once confined to small houses in, in hut homes, miracles around a few have now been revealed to thousands. It's hard to keep a secret when you feed 5,000 men plus women and children. So now he has a crowd. And it's so grown so large to the point that the religious leaders uh, engage in hyperbole, but they say, look, now the whole world is following after. And so because of that, crowds are beginning to follow, and so now they have to wait for the right time to arrest him. When the group is smaller, this is why they find him on Thursday night in Gethsemane, okay? So they're looking for the right time. Wednesday is where it all takes place, the turning point toward Jesus' arrest. Holy Thursday, a lot happens. The Last Supper, Jesus washes the disciples' feet. The institution of the Lord's Supper, all of that happens on Thursday. Before I forget, our men are going to be meeting this Thursday for Passion Week in person at 7 p.m. Join us. They have a, a unique gathering every fourth Thursday of the month. And so they'll be meeting on Holy Thursday here uh, at the house. Fellas, say amen. 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 So join us for that. But Holy Thursday, where Jesus establishes the sacrament and the ordinance of communion. And so, and then Good Friday, his crucifixion, and Holy Saturday, or Silent Saturday, or some call it Black Saturday, where Jesus is in the room, a day of reflection, a day of waiting, a day where it looks like nothing is happening and nothing is going on, but God is working underground. Amen. And so take this. I wrote it up for you, and obviously Resurrection Sunday, next Sunday, we celebrate as Easter. Take it for your personal devotional time. Uh, this week. Amen? Amen. I want to give that to you. But trusting God's solutions. Passion Week receives its name because Jesus willingly went to the cross and he displays his passion for humanity in various forms. Palm Sunday holds significance in Christianity because it starts off or it marks the beginning of the most sacred week in the Christian calendar. Is this the exact week? No, obviously not. But whenever we decide to celebrate it, God says that's all right with me. The Bible says in Scripture, some consider days more sacred than others. In other words, some celebrate on different days. Some celebrate this on a Friday, on a Sunday, on that day. It does not matter under our new covenant blessing. Whenever we decide to celebrate it, God says, you mark it as holy, fine, I'll do so as well. And you want to celebrate me on this day, that's okay. So I don't want you to get caught up in the legalism that some uh, of the alternate religions have and try to throw stones at us and say, he wasn't born on December 25th. Well, duh. That's not why we're celebrating. He didn't really get up on Easter. Well, duh, obviously not. We can look at some historical records and have some educated guesses on when it took place. But this is the week that we decide to celebrate it. So when it falls in March in 2024, that's okay. When it falls in April of 2025, that's fine or as well. All right? Save the drama for your mama. It's not fun. <laughs> Amen. But Palm Sunday marks the beginning of this passionate or this holy week. And all the four of the Gospels record this event that takes place. We can find it, and I give it to you in Scripture. We can find this event in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke does not alert us to the palms, so our passage today does not give us the tree branches or the palms. Matthew and Mark give us the tree branches, but John is the gospel that gets specific and lets us know that these are palm branches that they snatch down from the tree. So when you see children holding these palm branches, it's just symbolizing and commemorating this day that begun Jesus' passionate week. But all four of the Gospels record this event. But what I like about Luke is Luke records it from a unique perspective. Matthew is more interested in revealing Jesus as the king and the Messiah. 
So he has more of an emphasis on the things that Jesus said. Mark is the shortest of the books. Mark is, is I kind of consider him to be a 21st century or 22nd century gospel writer. He's not concerned with all of the details. Uh, I used to tell people Mark is for millennials. Um, Mark is like, look, I'm more concerned with what Jesus did. So he doesn't waste uh, or spend, not waste, spend a lot of time dealing with Jesus' origin story and how he was born. He's more concerned with Jesus as the servant of God. So Matthew's like, I'm more emphasis on what he said. Mark says, I emphasize more of what Jesus did did, John says, like I told you earlier, I want to emphasize who Jesus is. So he doesn't, he, he talks about Jesus' origin story, he, he, but, but he doesn't do it from his earthly birth narrative. He begins and says, Jesus is God incarnate. He's God wrapped in flesh. So let me tell you, he actually has no beginning. But in the beginning, the word was with God and the word was God. So it's God because God is who he is. So I don't even want to give you all of the miracles like the other gospel writers do. I just want to give you seven or eight of them that prove that Jesus is God. That's who he is. So Matthew is what he said. Mark is what he did. John is who he is. But Luke deals with the humanity of Jesus. You'll see this phrase a lot in Luke, son of man. Son of man, as Luke wants to deal with Jesus' humanity. So where Matthew deals with what Jesus said, Mark deals with what Jesus did, John deals with who Jesus is, Luke deals with how Jesus felt. Luke deals with how he felt. So you will see, tend to see more than other gospels, more emphasis or, or more clues that point to Jesus' emotions. What he's dealing with, what he's feeling, what he's going through. And so Luke deals with the feelings of Jesus. And this morning, dealing with the feelings feeling of Jesus, we see in our text, in the, verse, in the two verses, I want to emphasize that Jesus is sorrowful. He's crying. He's weeping. He's sad. Have you ever been in a situation where your emotions don't match the room? Or where your emotions don't match the crowd? Have, have, have you ever been at a funeral, perhaps, and you just wanted to support a friend, but you didn't know the person that well, so, so you're not quite grieving like they're grieving, though you are there amongst people who are weeping, you can't quite weep like they weep, so, so your emotions don't really match the moment? Or have you ever been in a moment where everybody's happy about something, but you're going through something, so, so, so you're really sad? If I had time, I could really use that and talk about how that happens a lot on our Sunday morning worship experiences. If Christians really be real and, and, and Pastor Gabriel or whoever comes to the mic and says, open your mouth, praise God, clap your hands, Shout for joy, hallelujah. But, but if y'all really knew what I was facing once Monday comes, I really don't match my, my emotional sadness doesn't quite match the joy that's in the room. Have you ever been in a situation where your emotions don't quite match? Christ does not match the crowd. We have a triumphal entry, a joyous crowd, but a sorrowful Christ. Christ and the crowd do not match. They're rejoicing, happy, jumping upon their feet, but, but he's over here holding back tears. They're saying rejoice, he's coming in the name of the Lord, glory in the highest heaven. But perhaps Jesus, as his lips are quivering, as he starts to hold it back, 
because he's recognizing, one, this is the end, but two, I have something to offer, and, and I don't know if they're going to receive it. So the crowd is rejoicing, but Jesus is crying. Christ and the crowd don't match. That should not be that hard for us to believe. Because if you really look close, Christ and the crowd have never really matched. If you really look close throughout history, we've always seen examples of this discord, this, 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 this mismatch, this counter behavior between Christ and the crowd. Between Christ and popular culture, between Christ and the social norms, where Christ's teachings begin to challenge us or they contradict the values and the norms and the behaviors of the surrounding culture, where Christ and culture don't match, where the teachings of Christ contradict the prevailing attitudes and the social norms of our time. Christ in the crowd don't match. Where Jesus showed up saying things like, love your enemies. Pray for those who talk about you. If somebody slaps you on the cheek, turn and give them the other one. Christ in the crowd have never matched. You want to live a blessed life? Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth. You, you want to save up for retirement? Do not store up for yourselves treasures here on earth where thieves can break in and steal, where the moths can eat away at your clothes. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You want to fight somebody? Blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called children of God. You cannot serve both God and money. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Jesus, you're going to be king. You're going to be king. What are you going to do? You're going to jump on a course and conquer? No, 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 no. If you want to be first, you got to serve. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. You want to be first? Well, get to the end of the line. The last shall be first. And the first shall be last. Christ and the crowd have never matched. This is what made his teaching so radical, so unique. This is what makes him stand out as he shows up proclaiming this new kingdom. And the Sermon on the Mount is the charter document for this new kingdom that he's proclaiming. This is how we act and conduct ourselves in this kingdom. This is the mindset of those who are citizens of this kingdom. This is the value system of those who are a part of this, scene, of this system. And they never match the crowd. If you're looking to fit in, Christianity may not be the thing for you. If you don't want to ruffle any feathers, I don't know if you want to be called by Christ. If you want to go along easy and not have any trouble and any trials and anybody bothering you or saying anything about you, I don't know if Christianity is truly going to be something that you're going to be a part of. And we don't preach like this enough. And this is why when trouble comes, Christians are so surprised because we bring them into the kingdom with promises of all the good things that God will do. And that is so counter. It's so countercultural to the kingdom that Jesus preached. From the very beginning, his kingdom was take up your cross and follow me. 
From the very beginning, like we preached about last week, Matthew, you want to follow me? Come on. Leave your job. Leave all your income. Leave your home. Everything you have now and follow me. Peter, you want to follow me? Your business has never seen a greater day than it has right now. On the greatest day of your business, you will make millions of dollars, Peter, by the time you get done selling all of your fish that I helped you to catch. But at the height of your business, follow me. Leave everything. See how strange this sounds in Western society, in Western democracy, because Christ and the crowd don't match. If I told you today, come follow Christ, call your job and tell them on Monday morning that you're willing to live like a pauper, you'll do whatever it takes. Don't do this now, y'all, okay? <laughs> we, we live in wild times. <laughs> Somebody will come on Monday morning, Pastor, I just heard that part that you said. <sighs> just listen to the example now. If I told you, call your job Monday morning, tell them this is it. Cow, oh, y'all don't hear me here. Do y'all read y'all Bibles? As a matter of fact, you say you want to be like the Bible. Let's get back to the word. Okay, you want to get back to the word? Let's go back to the Acts church. Cash in your 401k. Bring your Roth IRA to the house. Oh, you really want to be like the Bible, huh? Bring, come on, come on. Y'all, 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 y'all. You, you want to get rid of all this new stuff and let's go back to the Bible, Pastor Gabriel. Let's do it. The, okay, cash in your 401k, your Roth IRA, your investments. Bring them all to the house of God. Lay them at the man of God's feet as a symbol that you're willing to bring it to the body of Christ and let's all live like a nice socialist society where we all have things in common and let's all live off one another and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ and the crowd don't match. I'm going to take it a step further. I'm not sure sometimes Christ and the church always match. <laughs> but Christ and the crowd don't match. They say live once, so do everything you can in this lifetime. Things like follow your heart. It'll never go wrong. Look out for number one. Money buys happiness. Success at all costs. Watch this, this is a big one. Material possessions define success. By that definition, Jesus or none of the disciples we read in Scripture would be successful. Step on anybody at all costs. This is a big one. Winning is everything. Oh, this is a huge one. I may step on a few bunions with this one. Image is everything. That's bigger than you know. We're now in a time where we're no longer concerned on if things in our life work. We're more concerned if they look like they do. We are less concerned with having a healthy marriage. We're more concerned with having the nice pictures on social media that make our marriage look like it's healthy. We're no longer concerned with having healthy parenting relationships. We are more concerned with getting the right amount of likes because we had a good Palm Sunday play day with the family. Image is everything. Not that it actually works. Just let it look like it does. Not that our marriage is actually strong where we go to counseling and work on, you know, the stuff nobody talks about that, that's not thrilling. But, but, but just give me the big wedding day where I have a train that goes all the way down the aisle that everybody has to look out for. I, I just want the big way. Image is everything because Christ and the crowd don't match. So they are rejoicing, and Luke gives us a detail unique to his gospel that Jesus is crying. Matthew, Mark, and John do not record this, but Luke records this, that Jesus begins to weep. He's outside of Jerusalem, 
and he begins to weep as he starts descending, going down the hill of the Mount of Olives, and he looks over the city. Why do you want to point this out, Pastor Gabriel? There are only two times in the Gospels that explicitly record Jesus weeping. Only two times. Three times in all of scripture, if you consider Hebrews 5, where it talks about Jesus interceding with tears. I believe that's Hebrews 5, verse number, around verse number 7. Take it for your alone time. But, but nonetheless, the Gospels only record two times that Jesus weeps. Other passages in the Bible allude to his emotions and his experiences and suffering, like the Garden of Gethsemane. We know he's in agony. We know he's emotional. He's probably more than likely crying, but the Bible doesn't record that. It only explicitly records Jesus weeping twice. And thank God for John's gospel. He gives us the clue to let us know that the two times that Jesus weeps are not that far apart. They're close to one another. The first time Jesus weeps is in John 11.35. If there's one scripture you want to know, just know John 11.35. It'll get you out of trouble. Jesus wept. We gave that to a few children today who didn't uh, remember the verses quite well. I didn't have one for whatever reason. I said, listen, if you can't remember nothing else, John 11.35, Jesus wept. That'll get you out of trouble. Somebody ever come up to you and say, you don't know any verses in scripture. You tell them John eleven thirty five. 35. I know that Jesus <laughs> wept. You can look that verse up. That's all it is. Just two words. Je no, literally, Jesus wept. Verse number 36. That's all it says. Jesus, the shortest two verses, the shortest verse in the English Bible. There's a shorter one in the Greek, but the shortest verse in the English Bible, John eleven thirty five, 35, Jesus wept. Jesus is at the tomb of his friend Lazarus. And the Bible says while he is standing there, Jesus wept. What makes that time unique is we don't know why. There has been much debate on why Jesus weeps here. Some say he's weeping at the death of his friend. I tend to think, why? Because it's clear that he's about to raise him up. So why would he weep over someone he's getting ready to resurrect? Some say he, he, he weeps over the fact that he's trying to have empathy and, and sympathize with his sisters. Some theorize or surmise that Jesus is weeping because of the people's lack of faith. Some say that Jesus is weeping because he's weeping over the result of sin. Because the sting of sin is death. Oh, if I had some time to talk to you here this morning. And could it be possible that he's weeping on, 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 on the outgrowth of Adam's sin decision? Could he be weeping over the fact that sin has touched everything? And I was there in the beginning when I created you, and I created you to live eternally, and I now see that sin has touched everything that I've made. That's a possibility, but we don't know. We can guess at best that, that Jesus, why Jesus is weeping, at the tomb of Lazarus. But what makes you, Luke unique is Luke gives us the reason. Luke gives us the reason why Jesus starts crying while everyone <coughs> is rejoicing. Luke says Jesus is coming down the hill and Jesus starts crying at verse number 41. As he approached the city, he wept over it, verse 42. If you, even you, had only known what would bring you peace. You can leave that up for a second. Thank you, media. If you, only you, had known what would bring you peace. We don't have to guess why he's crying. He cries once over a man 
But now in Luke 19, he's crying over a city. He weeps over a man or perhaps a family, but now he's weeping over a city. And he's weeping over a city because he's saying, if you had only known what would bring you peace. I only got about eight more minutes this morning. This is the crux of my message. If you only you had known what would bring you peace? Why is Jesus weeping over a city? If you had only known Jerusalem, what would bring you peace? Jesus laments over the city of Jerusalem. This is not the first time that we see him sorrowful or where he expresses his sorrow over this city. In Matthew, write it down, you don't have to turn there, verse number 20, chapter 23, verses 37 through 39, Matthew 23, verse 37 through 39, it records Jesus lamenting over Jerusalem in another place where he talks, he says, Jerusalem, I wanted to gather you as a mother hen gathers her chicks and brings them in, but you would have none of it. I'm trying to bring you in, but you keep rejecting me. He's weeping over the fact that, that I've made God known to you, but you reject me. I'll even take it a, a, another step further. It, it would take some time. We, we, we need a Wednesday night to prove this. Not only will your rejection lead to your eternal damnation and burning in hell fire, watch this, but you're going to burn hotter than others. Your fire is going to be that much more hotter than the Mormon's fire. See, we don't talk about hell enough. Why is that? The Mormons have also rejected Jesus as the Christ. The Muslims have rejected Jesus as the Christ. Someone somewhere in unreached people group, if they reject Jesus as the Christ, the Bible's clear that they are eternally separated from God for all of eternity. But he says, I will judge the depths of your punishment are based on your, 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 your closeness to the truth. Oh, glory to God. The depths of your destruction will be decided by, 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 by how close you were to the truth. If I had time to prove this, I would go back and look at Judas's life. This is why when Jesus spoke about Judas, he says it would be better for him if he had never been born. There are some people who are going to burn, but, but for Judas, it's going to be better for him if he had never been born. Why? Because Judas had access to the truth. Like nobody could. He walked with me for three years. He was among the twelve. He saw my raw power. He saw me stand out on the waters and say, peace be still. He saw me with the widow of Nain's son touch the casket and get up out of the grave and the boy starts walking. He saw me take two fifth, five loaves and feed probably 15,000 people at one time just with a prayer of blessing. He saw me get out of the boat, approach the Gadarene demoniac, thousands of demons potentially in him. Chains could not hold him down. And I just speak one word. And this man gets set free. And yet and still he chose silver over me. What, let me ask you this question, what will it take to make you believe. 
Do you think you need the audible voice of God? Why have you ever said this? Maybe you're not like me. Why don't God talk to me like he did Abraham? Then I'd be sure I'd hear his voice. I'd show sure enough obey him and follow him then. Why doesn't he speak to me like he spoke to Moses? Mostly when he speaks to me, it's in cold. It, it, I have to walk in, in, in an intimate relationship with him to decipher what he's really saying. But when he spoke to Moses, the Bible said he spoke to him plainly like one speaks to a friend. Moses didn't have to decode too much because they were so close. His face shined with the glory of God because God spoke to him. Face to face. What would it take for you to hear God? And these people see Jesus for three years set in Galilee on fire. And yet, when the rubber will hit the road, they will reject him as Messiah. If only you knew what would bring you peace. But you have rejected it. And I am weeping over you, Jerusalem, because you are taking a way that is not going to work, and I'm offering a better way, and it is causing me to weep. Can I preach here this morning? This is where it gets applicable for us today. We are saved, but is there a way that God calls us to walk in, but we refuse and we go on more another way, and it is causing Holy Spirit to grieve? Whether you know it or not, the Bible lets us know that Holy Spirit, he does grieve, he does cry. The Bible says, grieve not the Holy Spirit. It grieves him when he tries to push us in the right direction and yet we go another way and he says, if only you knew what would bring you peace. But you're chasing after the wrong thing because the crowd in Christ don't match. I feel like just sitting here just a little bit longer, just a little bit longer. Christ and the crowd don't match and we chase after things we go after things we spend our lifetimes chasing after everything but Christ and could it be possible that Christ is crying weeping on our behalf saying I have a way if you just walk in it because I know your way seems right, but the Bible is clear. There's a way that seems right unto a man, but in the end, it will lead to destruction. Have you ever been going the right way? Let me take you back in time. Can we step in the time machine before we had GPS, before we had, I'm going to take a step further, before we had map quests and had a full print out of where we were going, and you just had to drive and figure out, write down a few notes, Notes on a card, turn left on 12th, right on 34th to get to where you're supposed to go. And the way looks right, but you end up at a dead end. There's a way that can seem right, but in the end it leads in death into destruction, into a dead end, over a cliff. I know the job looks right, but it could be a cliff. I know the woman looks right, but it could be a cliff. I know the man looks fine as wine, but it could be a cliff. He's got a six pack, she's got long hair and nails, fit just how you like, but in the end. I wish I could talk to some people who would testify this morning that can step outside of their church hat, take off those fancy church clothes and get real. I can talk to you about some times in my life where I messed up, where I thought I got it right. I thought I was going in the right direction. I thought this is surely the way and it's going to work out right, but it ended up in death. And you waste years of your life going in a direction that God does not have for you. 
And he's sitting back in heaven saying, if only they knew what would bring you peace. Oh my gosh, can I go a little step further? It, it brings me to the song. I'm reminded of the song, Oh, what peace. We often forfeit. It's an old hymn. You may not know it. It says, oh, what peace we often forfeit. Watch this. Oh, what needless pains we bear. There's pains we bear that we don't even need. Why? All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. God's just saying on, on, on the 11th anniversary of our prayer line, God just said, I have a way if you just walk in it. If you stop trying to knock on every door, rub every elbow, network with every person, scratch the right back. If you just go into your prayer closet and get down on your knees, watch this. First. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. I don't mean network. I don't mean don't fill out the applications if you need a job. I mean do that last. Go to God first. I didn't say don't date. I didn't say don't join Christian Mingle or the latest app to try to find somebody. I'm saying go to God first. Before you start your search, God, is this where you want me to go? Lead me to the place. Guide me as I open the doors. Use me as I knock on the door. Lead me to the right person. And God has a way of putting his super on top of your natural and leading you to the right place. I wish I had some spies in the room where Joshua and them prayed and as they spied out the land, God led them to the house of a harlot. He'll lead you to the right place if you acknowledge him. I wish I had some Proverbs 3 and 5, 3 and 6 Christians. Acknowledge him and he'll direct your path. Trust in the Lord. With all of your heart, everything that's within you, watch this. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways, if you acknowledge me, I'll direct your path. Be not wise in thine own eyes. In other words, don't think you can do it on your own. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It'll bring health to your body. Oh, I wish I had somebody who knew the scriptures and nourishment to your bones. But we carry needless pain. Because we don't trust God's solution. And Jesus is weeping because he says, I have a solution, but you refuse to adhere to my solution. You will witness more than all the generations before you have ever witnessed. This is why everyone in this generation, if you look close to scriptures, they're called blessed in a unique way unlike others. John the Baptist Amongst all of the prophets, he's considered blessed because he actually got to see the Christ. He's the last of the Old Testament order of prophets, but he gets to see the Christ. He's not like Isaiah. He's not like Ezekiel. He's not like Jeremiah. He gets to see him. Peter gets to see him. Judas gets to see him. This generation in Jerusalem, Capernaum, Galilee, the surrounding areas get to see Jesus everything that he does but they reject his solution and we spend our lives looking for our solutions and God has one I'm beginning to recognize and understand that God's and this is what caused me to write Friday's message deliverance and that God's deliverance 
doesn't quite look how I always think. You ever get a picture in your mind how you know something's going to look? How, and, and I'm just beginning, I was speaking with some friends yesterday after a meeting, and I said, I'm just beginning to recognize that even God, what God gives us in visions, it may not za- exactly manifest how we think it's going to look. So I have to keep my eyes open to say, wait a minute, this is that, even though it may not look like how I thought. If Joseph had, if it had looked like what Joseph had seen, he would have saw literal sun, moon, and stars bowing down to him. But it didn't look like what he thought. It was a symbol of something that was to come. It never really looks how you think, how you have one idea in mind, but God has another idea in mind. And how the people had an idea of how this king, this savior, this Messiah was going to look. He is going to be a conquering king in the line of David. And David was a warrior, so I know he's got to be able to fight. And Jesus shows up talking about if somebody slaps you in the face. Turn the cheek and give them the other one. No, nah, no, nah, David was slaying Goliath. He was killing all these people we have it in our Old Testament records. He was cutting people's heads off. He was killing people, bringing foreskins back to the king. This guy was just a radical guy, and Jesus shows up saying, I'm willingly laying my life down. So I let you handcuff me. And he's weeping because he has an answer. That they don't want to receive. Their answer is an immediate political upheaval of the nation of Rome. Jesus' solution is an invisible kingdom starting in the hearts of individuals. Christ in the crowd do not match. Their solution is grab a sword, Jesus, grab a shield. Peter will be your general. James and John will be there too. We will be the first 12. Let's get the army going. It shouldn't be hard to recruit because you just fed 5,000 men plus women and children. And we are going to overthrow the Romans. Some of those miracles or magic tricks that you just worked, do those on the emperor and the king. Ah, and we will be out of this thing. And, and, and we reduce Jesus' miracle working power to a magic trick. When we try to tell him to do it, when we want you to do it, do it at the time that I want, in the way that I want. Deliver me in the way that... Uh, is anybody like me that you feel like your life would be better if God just answered the prayer that you told him to answer see my issue is not that God answers prayer my issue and I'm like God you're answering prayer but you're not answering the ones that I need you to answer I need you to answer the ones like a house a new car uh, Let my children have good behavior at school. Don't let the school call me one more time. Please, please, Jesus, don't let them call me this week. And and he doesn't answer any of that, but, but he'll go all the way over there and answer the prayer for patience, like put me at the end of the line at the bank. I, I thank you, Father, but, but, but prayer of uh, patience is not the answer I'm looking for right now. I, I need coin right now, Father. And he's over there working on the fruits of the Spirit. Well, I want him to work on the natural, everyday thing. But, but I'm learning now that you've got to trust God's solution. That his solutions, his answers accomplish something that you cannot see. So they're pushing him up on a donkey saying, Hosanna, go do our bidding. We kind of know how this is going to go, Father. Go ahead and uh, get on the horse. We'll follow you. And when all of this happens, it'll turn in our favor. We love to shout and sing and preach about that. The battle belongs to the Lord. It'll turn in our favor. It looks good. It will. 
God have all things work together for the good. That is so true. All of those things are true. But, but, but what if God bringing good out of a situation is you staying in it for a season? And his solution is I'm going to have you stay in it for a while longer because I am perfecting something in you. So, so... So, so, so Israel, I'm telling you now, it, it, it's, it's going to look like I've lost, but you've got to keep your eyes peeled. It's going to look like I've failed, but, but you got to keep your eyes open. It's going to look like I'm down. But you got to keep it. I'm getting you ready for the week, whether you know it or not. It's going to get dark on Friday. But, but you got to keep your eyes open. Somebody is in the midst, so they're approaching their spy Wednesday. You're all in it by yourself. You're approaching your, 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 your Thursday night, standing before the Sanhedrin, asking you questions that they really don't want to hear the answers to. And you don't find a friend in anybody but in Jesus. Some of you are in your Good Friday by yourself. Praying by yourself, taking the whipping by yourself. You feel like nobody quite understands by yourself, but you've got to keep your eyes peeled for Christ's solutions. Because he says, Your solution is a temporary kingdom, political overthrow. My solution is an invisible kingdom. Yours is a natural kingdom. Mine is an invisible kingdom that starts in you. So accept my solutions. Accept, it's all right, y'all. Accept my solutions. I hear praise that's going on out there. Glory to God. Accept my solutions. This word means more to some people than you think. You never know what somebody's facing. You never know. This is why sometimes some of y'all be saying, quit, quit, quit. I can see faces and I can key in when this word means something to, more, to somebody else than it does to you. I saw Brother Man the whole time. It meant a little more to him than it does to you. You never know what the word of God is going to do to somebody. You've got to trust his solutions. I put this in my notes. I'm done. I really am done. How different would our lives look if we didn't rebel against the plan of God? The tears of Jesus are the tears of when God sees the needless pain and suffering we experience when we rebel against his will. Most of God's plans deal with the root while we want him to deal with the fruit. I had in my notes, roots and fruits. Thank you, I'm done with that scripture. Most of our, our problems deal with the fruits, and we deal, he wants to deal with the root. He says, I know you see the Romans oppressing you, but at the root of all this evil is this sin problem. If I could get at the cancer that's eating away at all of humanity, that's the root. I know you want me to deal with the fruit. The fruit is this person is killing this person. This person is messed with this person. This nation is messed with the, all. That's the fruit. The root of it all is S-I-N, sin. That's the root. And if I can deal with the root, it'll be right. I'm going to say this and I'm done. I was walking into the gym uh, about a month, maybe maybe five weeks, six weeks ago, just a normal day like normal, going in at my normal morning time, usual time. I stepped up on the step to go into the gym. I don't know if there was a sniper outside. I don't know if I got bit by something. There was a pain that shot up my back like I have never felt before. I'm talking about some I'm some pain pain. I have a high, I'll brag on that. I have a high pain tolerance and a high pain threshold. I always have. I had some, some bad injuries in my lifetime, but I've never been the type of cry to don't weep over them. I feel bad because I put my children through that suffering. They really be hurting. I'm like, stand up. You're all right, you know. But not everybody's, you know, 
not everybody's like me. I was telling my son, stand up. You all right? You all right? Shake it off. He had broken his clavicle. His shoulder was broken. And I'm like, you all right? You all right? So don't be like me, y'all. Don't be like me. Um, and, and so I had but, but this thing nearly brought me to my knee. I said, oh. At that moment, I turned into, do I have any 98-year-old people in here? Okay. I turned into like a 98-year-old man. I said, oh. I let out the most womanly sound ever in my life. I did not sound like a man on this day. Please don't shame me. I, again, I felt like there was a sniper outside somewhere. It said, I said, oh. I looked around. Nobody was around. Like, man, how are we going to get out of this? So I just said, ah. ah. This is a true story. I knew the day was over, the week was over. I mean, everything had changed in this one split second. Like, oh, we're done here. I scooted back to my car, just a step at a time. I knew, I said, I have to get to the hospital right now. This, this, I, oh my goodness, I said, oh, oh. So, but now the issue is I get to the Jeep, I gotta climb up in this Jeep. You don't realize your back is connected everything until it goes out. <laughs> everything, I'm talking about I didn't wanna cough, I didn't want to sneeze. I didn't want everything's connected. I didn't want to laugh. Everything's connected to your back. Every step, stepping up into the thing, sitting down, everything. I said, oh, so I'm just going. And I'm just going. I make it to the car. I just bite my tongue and mm, jump up in there. I'm driving, I put my hazards on because while I'm driving, it's so, I can't even turn to look in my lane to get over. It's that bad. Like, it, you, I'm telling you, the back's connected to everything. If you have a back problem, we're going to pray for you when service is out. Of. Like, I couldn't, I couldn't even want to look over to see if I can get over in the lane. So I would just look in my blind spot mirror and say, oh, well, God, Jesus, take the wheel. And just, uh, and just go. I would only have to do it once or twice. I, I, I got right down, drove right to TG. The next step is now getting out of the car and trying to get in there. So I get out. I get there. It's, this was a little, because I didn't go any faster than this. It was just this the whole way. I get in there. The lady's like, sir, and she's talking way too regular for me. I just, sir, man, you know, you don't care about anything until you really get in an emergency. I'm, she's talking way too casual. Sir, how you doing today? Well, obviously, I'm not doing good, ma'am. I'm bent <laughs> over. And so, in just a coincidence, you could say, I guess, because there's somebody in there with the exact same back issues. So we were walking the same, an Indian gentleman, and, and, and so we were walking the same way. But he had his wife with him, and his wife said he's dealt with this before because I ended up talking to him. But long story short, I get there to him, and they're asking me all these questions I don't care nothing about. Like, how tall are you? What is your weight? I'm like, what? what, what what's your address? Can you give it? I don't care about any of this right now. I'm like, man, I, I need what you give the NBA players. Like, shoot me up with something <laughs> right now. Like, right away. And so they're asking me all this stuff, and they get me in there, and she gets me on the table, and they shoot me up with some Toradol right away. I said, thank you, Jesus. It did not take long. That Toradol kicked in about 15 minutes. Oh, man, I was able to sit up, at least on the bed long enough. I was feeling okay. I still didn't feel too comfortable to walk regular, so I just was still trying to take it slow. But I felt better to at least stand up a little bit. And I said, this is good. And you know what I wanted to do? I wanted to get in my car and get back home and go to the gym and go on with business as usual. <clears throat> because I was after something to solve the symptom. I was not after a long-term solution. Whatever this pain was, I just thought maybe a strain or something like this or something, it'll, it'll be all right. Give it some time and we'll go back. Because I hate, if anybody knows me, knows I'm heavily regimented. I'm, I don't really like surprises because the whole time I can't even enjoy it because I'm thinking about what would I be doing normally in this time you've thrown off my regimen. And I'm very red, so I'm thinking, sitting there thinking the whole time like, I would be concluding my workout right now. <laughs> Getting ready to pull up to the church. Go in and do this and that. Go on with my business. And I got the shot. 
and just wanted to go on with business as usual. They said, sir, we got to get you some x-rays. We got to check to make sure, because I told them, is it a disc or whatever? I, stuff I don't even know, but I just, you know, watching sports. I just started listing injuries. Did I slip a disc? Is it, did I pinch a nerve? Is it spinal? Uh, like Mike Tyson used to say, spinal, I broke my back. I don't know what it is. <laughs> what is it, Mike? Spinal. I, whatever that was, it hurt. <laughs> and, I, and, and most of the time, if we be honest with God, this is what we're after. I'm done. I promise you this is my, my point. We want a quick shot of spiritual toward all to let us keep going on our way, handling our business the way we think best. And God's saying, I got to put you on pause, lay you down for a minute. X-ray your life. Show you where things may be broken or may be off. Give you an MRI. EKG, whatever it is. I was open to anything at that point as long as it didn't come back. I said, give me MRI, EKG, a massage, a COVID vaccination, a flu vaccination. <laughs> CPR, measles, mump, and rubella. Have I had my tetanus? Anything you have. The little health knowledge I had, I was throwing it all out there. Do I, is, will that do it? And all we want from sometimes God is just a shot to say, let me keep going. And he says, I want to lay it down. Put the x-ray on your heart, on your life. Show you the things in your life that I'm trying to fix. You got that jealousy issue that you've been dealing with for a long time, man. And it kills everything in you. He's the doctor, you know. It, it kills everything I want to give you. I know you don't see it as a big deal. Your number one prayer right now is your rent, your car, your house. But, but everything I give you, you get jealous of what somebody else gets. It kills what I give you because you compare it to what this person got. So, so I know I'm not answering the prayer for the house, but looking at the x-ray, this quick shot, this, this rent that you want me to pay, it may stop the pain for this month. But that bitterness that you have with that loved one or that family member, if only you knew what would bring you peace. Do you think it's the finances, this and that and the other? If only you knew that if I can give you a patience, a peace that transcends all natural human understanding, it's totally disconnected from circumstance. So when the world's on fire, your heart is still pure. When things are going good, I can still trust you and not turn from it. Your heart is still pure. So my spiritual x-ray exposes that these things need to be worked on in your life. So I weep because you're sad that I didn't answer the prayer that you thought I needed the answer to. I needed to answer. But if only you knew what would bring you peace. So what am I after this morning? I'm after what my title says simply. I want you to leave this Palm Sunday morning trusting God's solutions. Whether it's for your marriage, whether it's for your family, whether it's for your parenting, whether it's in my case for this church, my marriage, my family, it's applicable to everybody. All of us have problems. Problems are universal to the human experience. Everybody's going to go through something. But God has solutions. And don't get down when his solutions don't match your definition of deliverance. Just close your eyes this Palm Sunday morning and say, God, I'm going to trust your solution. So, God, as you go to the cross and they nail your hands and it doesn't look like we're winning, I'll trust your solution. I'm not going to be like Peter and be ready to pull my sword and cut off ears and try to stop you from going to the cross because that's not the solution. You're accomplishing something that far outweighs anything I'm going through. So, Father, I'm going to trust your solution. 
Father, we thank you for this word. Thank you for hiding it in our hearts. Thank you, Father, that we have chosen on this Palm Sunday morning to trust your solution. Thank you, Father, that you have the solution to sin. It is your blood. Thank you, Father, that silver and gold, money, finance, a car, a house, a job, none of that is worth anything. It can't save us. We may be rich naturally, but all of us have once been poor in spirit. And Father, only your blood can pay the spiritual debt that we owe. So thank you for your solution. That you were willing to go through with it even when you were misunderstood. Even when you were cele weren't celebrated in the proper way. You sat there on a donkey anyway and wept and went through what you had to go through in order to redeem us. I thank you for these people in this room sitting attentively to hear my voice but Father, you're, I believe you were speaking through me. They heard me naturally, but I pray that they heard you spiritually. That they heard you. And this word would be cut to every person and their unique situation. I pray for families in this season. I pray for marriages. I pray for children in this season. As babies cry, I pray for babies in this season thank you for them thank you father that you know who we are you know all about us and as we started this text reading this morning if you know where a donkey is if you know everything there is to know about him are we not much more than a donkey you didn't die for a cult you died for us you didn't make the animals redeemable you died for us. So, Father, thank you this morning that you care about us. Forgive us where we've doubted you, where we have spoken ill or misunderstood your plans. We don't want to be like Job's friends and speak wrong of your plans in our lives or in the lives of others. So, Father, today we decide to close our mouths and just yield to the Spirit's work. We pray that you would give us guidance to speak at the right time. Thank you for this Passion Week. As the weeks get busy, as they normally do, we go to work, go to daycares to pick up our children, drop children off at school, go to our doctor's appointments, go and pick up our grandparents, grandparents take care of grandchildren, all the things, cook, marriage work, all the things that just go with life grocery stores, pay bills. I pray that we not get so busy that we forget what you've done for us this week. I pray for a closeness, a unique revelation to come as people spend devotional time with you. That you would show them something they've never seen before. Even I, Father, can approach the scriptures arrogantly, thinking we've known it all and seen it all. And we read the resurrection story again because it's another day on the calendar. I pray that you would open our eyes to something new, something fresh in what you've done for us. Bless these people as they leave this place in Christ's name. Amen. Can you join me?